Hello, everyone. I'm Sylvie Hodes from World Water Week. I'm a YSPC member organizing this seminar series along with Aaron, Marco and Christina. Thank you all so much for joining us here for this online session. A reminder that this is part of a three part series on the art of water diplomacy. Um, so join us again tomorrow from 4 p.m. Stockholm time, both online and in person, if you want a more process based focus. And again, on Wednesday at 2 p.m. in person here in Stockholm, um, where we'll delve into some case studies. Um, a big thank you to our co-conveners, whom we couldn't have done this without. That's the IUCN, EcoPeace Middle East, UNESCO, and of course, our key collaborating partner, the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So without further ado, please welcome Drs. Aaron Salzberg and Shafiko Islam, who will hopefully help us answer the title of this seminar, What is Water Diplomacy? Over to you. Great. Thank you, Sylvie, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Sylvie said, my name is Aaron Salzberg. I'm currently the director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina, and I serve alongside, as Sylvie said, Christina Arango, Marco Keskinen, uh, and on the Scientific and Planning Committee for World Water Week, and it's a real pleasure to be here for everyone. We're really excited about this seminar series on the art of water diplomacy. I think over the course of this week, you're going to hear a lot about water diplomacy, both as a means of preventing and mitigating conflicts over water and as a diplomatic tool to promote trust and cooperation and to strengthen institutional resilience and social cohesion where other tools may not exist. Uh, what we hope to do over the course of the next several days through this series is to explore the complex system of systems that often defines the context in which water disputes occur and discuss the approaches that diplomats and practitioners in conflict resolution use to create a space where meaningful and productive dialogue can occur. If it sounds a little wishy-washy, it is uh, in part because that's the nature of the problems. And, and while science can help guide us to the solutions, how we get people and countries to those solutions may be a bit of an art. And so to start us off, we've invited Professor Shafiq Islam, Director of the Water Diplomacy Program at Tufts University and co-editor of the soon to be released Water Diplomacy Handbook to help establish the foundation for some of these conversations. Shafiq, are you with us? Shafiq, I see you, but I do not hear you. You will need to unmute yourself. Okay, so can you hear me right now? I can. Perfect. Thank you, Shafiq. All right. Uh, good good, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Let me see that I can just put my screen first and then we will start. Okay. Sh share. Okay. Share apartment. Because what I'd, I'd like to start off, and I'd like to make this a little bit conversational, but I'd like to start off, Shafiq, by asking you the question as to what makes these water problems so challenging. All right. Thank you, Aaron. So, yeah, I think as we have been talking for quite a while for our handbook, so let me start with this idea that there is a broad consensus globally, there is a global water crisis. But then if you ask any of us that what is the most significant or most important water challenge right now? Often the answer will start, it depends. So what does it depend on? It depends on whom you ask, and who is answering the question and and why are they answering that question? So let's look at three observations that I have from the global to national to community scale. The water crisis is one of the most pressing development challenge across the globe, number one. Number two, chronic underinvestment in water infrastructure has created serious problem in the United States. Number three, People in Kibera slum in Kenya does not have access to water. Now, these three problems are very different. And you ask me really, what, why is it a problem and why is it so challenging? Now, these three problems, if we have to define what is the problem space, it will be very difficult to identify unless we also ask really, why are we asking that question? What is the global crisis? Why is there is no access to water in the slum? Then we go back to really few things that I want to emphasize and briefly to go over. Let me see if I can get this to work again. Slide show. And if, yeah, if you could put that in slide mode, that would be helpful. Yeah. 
There you go. Can you can you see now? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So essentially, then let's recognize that there are issues of scales and boundaries. These will cross boundaries and is dependent on context. Then we will categorize DLC. There are different types of problems. Not all of the problems are the same. We're talking about simple, complicated, and complex. Then we want to want to acknowledge something we call uncertainty and ambiguity. Often, really, we confuse these two. We have a difficult time understanding what is uncertainty and what is ambiguity, and why does it even matter? And then we have difficulty synthesizing what is scientific and social. Now, if we want to talk about what a diplomacy really, first thing then we need to recognize really, how do I di diagnose the problem? So to paraphrase Einstein, so he was told that if I have only one hour to solve any problem in the world, and he suggested that he would spend 55 minutes in diagnosing the problem and five minutes to ad start addressing the problem. What we are finding in water field, we're spending 55 minutes in trying to solve the problem without even understanding what the problem is. So with that, I think I'll start. And maybe as Aaron suggested, and I think I agree with that, we want to make this more conversational than just me talking and you listening. So maybe you will ask me some question and we'll go back and forth. And that would probably help clarify some of these more complicated ideas. Yeah, thanks, Shafiq. Uh, that's that's not going to be too possible with uh, me on the line, so don't worry about that. Um, but but let's go back to this first point that you're talking about, which is uh, this idea that these disputes that are happening may not be just over water. What do you mean by by that? So when we talk about water, so let me just give you one example that is going on right now in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh has just gone through basically this popular uprising. There is a new government. Unfortunately, within a week of taking that on, they have a massive flood going on right now. This flood now is in a very different location than the major flood that happens in Bangladesh, in three major rivers. This is happening in the northeast and southeastern Bangladesh. So there is a dam, which is a very small dam. It only holds about 750 million cubic meters of water. Now, Bangladesh is blaming that India has released water from that dam that is causing the flood, which is totally unfounded. Because it just simply, the dam can hold about 94 meter of water. If it is over 94 meter, it will just spill over. And it did. But if you look at the actual catchment area, catchment area in just one day can have rainfall more than, more, more than 700 million cubic meter of water. So as a result, there is a lot of misinformation that will go on when there is animosity between two countries. So Bangladesh is blaming that India is releasing water. India is saying, no, we are not releasing water. This is just a spillover. So this is one issue really just focusing on water. Then you also have all kinds of other things will come into picture. Is water a single entity? Or water should be linked with food? Should it be linked with trade? Should it be linked with energy? then it becomes more complex. What we tend to do in, in the water community particularly is that we are focusing water as just a single object. While it is not true really, when I basically bring in food in Saudi Arabia, I'm also bringing in water. Saudi Arabia doesn't have any water really to grow food. So you're bringing in virtual water that is embedded, but it's not accounted for. So that's the reason I don't think you can just take water as a single issue and then think about that this is a water problem. Yeah, I think that's why I, I often refer to it as this complex system of systems where we've got the water system, the ag, the economic systems, the political social systems, uh, and we, you know, we even have security relationships and systems that are going on here. And all these things are overlapping and interacting with each other. And I think that's what makes these problems uh, both uh, complicated and complex and, and exciting. Um, maybe ask a quick question about that. What Can you give me a, a better sense about this difference between a, a simple, complicated, and complex problem? All right, so let me just go to the next slide, I think. So what we essentially try to, if we want to understand the problem in a little bit in a simpler form. So I said, okay, the water problems or any other these collective action problems are really a combination of three different domains of problem. There is a simple natural domain where in this water case, we have water quality, water quantity, and ecosystem. These are more or less scientifically understood. 
we can quantify them. We can basically put some numbers. Then on the other side, we have societal problem. Uh, what are the governance regime for water? What are the assets? Assets does not necessarily mean in only economic assets. It could be even human resources as an asset or norms and values. For example, who am I to tell really Ganges water is not clean because this is holy water. And when it, it is one of the most polluted river in the world, but it is holy for Hindus. So that is a problem that I cannot simply resolve by bringing in whatever scientific facts I want. At the same time, both of these are happening really in a politically real world. So they are spinning continuously. And what they, that does really, it creates a lot of boundaries and scales and context and capacity. And it poses a complex set of choices for the stakeholders. That's where basically this uncertainty of scientific information and ambiguity of interpretation, what I mean really by water scarcity. What does water access mean? That creates a very problematic situation. Now, if you want to make it very simple, as Aaron was suggesting, what is a simple problem? Simple problem is just creating a very efficient water flushing toilet. A very efficient, very engineering, I can do it. I can just buy a flushing toilet that it will only take one gallon of water. It used to take three gallons even in Boston. Right now, one flush is one gallon. That's a simple problem. We solved it. That's an engineering problem. No problem there. Complicated problem is that now you want to bring water to your home at 18th floor. You want to get a hot shower in the morning. That's a complicated problem because the water is, for example, in Boston is coming from about 50 kilometers away from a big reservoir. It's coming through pipes. We're putting chlorination, heating system, pumps and turbines. And I get it. So this is my complicated problem. Complex problem is the Jordan River. This river now crosses many, many political boundaries, social boundaries, and even sectoral boundaries. How do I manage this is very different than building a simple problem. What we often then confuse that these problems are not the same. Unless I diagnose the problem as simple and then put complex, basically, tools, we're in trouble. Or vice versa, if I try to solve a complex problem with simple tools, it will not work. So what is very important really for us is to diagnose the problem. And we go back to Einstein, 55 minutes to try to understand what the problem is. And then how do you translate that ideas into action? Yeah, that I would probably, Shafi... please Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Now, that probably would help us really in these three sessions that we are hoping to achieve is what it do, what a diplomacy and what it can or cannot do. No, I think that's very helpful. I think one of the things that you and I have talked a little bit about is that in simple problems, these cause and effect relationships still kind of hold. It's easy to see what leads to what and how you might intervene in order to prevent a certain thing from happening. But in these very complex systems and system interactions, we, we can no longer, these cause and effect relationships are very, very difficult to disentangle. We have what we th call our emergent problems that come from these very complex system interactions. And you can't, uh, they, these things are not things that are readily forecastable. And because you don't understand these cause and effect relationships, it's difficult to figure out how we intervene. And that's one of the messages I hope that we can explore a little bit as this session uh, goes goes on is that it really is these diplomatic tools and how we build these relationships and the way people talk to each other that allows you to address these emergent problems that come from these complex systems. Uh, at least that's part of my thinking around this. Perfect. I think I think this, so that is I think is basically a good way to go to my next one. So what we have been doing really, I think at least in the water community primarily, we really focus on watershed. So watershed is this natural boundary. So if you take Jordan River, so that's the watershed. It involves uh, several countries. So the Jordan River flows through that. It starts in one place, it, it, it drains in somewhere else. So this is my watershed. But that's not what really we're interested in. When I'm trying to do policy, policy really does not obey the boundaries of the watershed. It may have a very different shed really depending on what policy I want. It could be just a policy between Israel and Palestine or Israel and Jordan or Syria and Jordan. So that policy shed is quite different than watershed. Then you have something we call problem shed. And problem shed could be focusing on something totally different. Now, when these three sheds are not aligning properly, then what ends up happening that we have all kinds of interpretational problem. This is what I call ambiguity. See, ambiguity has nothing to do with the scientific facts. Ambiguity comes in really, your problem may not be my problem. 
you may think that basically the problem of really uh, Tabias Lake really between Israel and Jordan is the problem. And Palestinians may not think that way. So the question then becomes, unless now these three groups come together and jointly define what their problem is, we're not going to go anywhere. So is that water diplomacy is not a really a panacea that you give us a tool and then we get it done. No, it's not a cookbook. It is basically a recipe that basically will tell you how to organize this problem or how to think about this problem. So first we start, okay, is this a simple problem? No, the, the conflict of water between Israel, Jordan, and Palestine is not a simple problem. I think as Aaron basically in our discussion came out many times, but at the same time, we should not get discouraged that most of these problems are complex. Many of them are not. Many of these problems are really either some simple or complicated, and there are solutions that can be done by very simple technological invent intervention or diplomatic negotiation at some level. Some complex problems. For example, how do you now decide to share water from the Nile with the Jard and the basically Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia is a complex problem. And that has to have a very different types of tools and discussion than just trying to see really, I want to give access to water in Kibera slum. Great, Shafiq. Um, we have to bring this to a close, but I just want to reemphasize the four points that you made as we go forward for the rest of the week. Uh, you know, one, these can be very simple, complex or complicated problems. And these are you know, how we define the problem is very important to thinking about the interventions we want to bring to bear. And the idea of scope and scale impact that, the timeframes, the dimensions, the problem along those different uh, areas that you talked about. And of course, how uncertainty and ambiguity plays a role in how we describe, define, and resolve these challenges. I think these are all great messages for us to be able to take forward over the rest of the week. Um, and thank you. One last message, Shafiq, you want to highlight? Yes. So, so this is what I think. This is maybe it, to some extent. Just one minute, though. Yes, yeah, self-promotion for us, really. This. So what we have argued so far, I think I hope you'll take this on because I'm sorry that I'll not be there really to make you more convinced about this. When science cannot provide the certainty that we want and the society faces ambiguity to decide what to do, then what we need is water diplomacy. And that's what we have tried to do really in the handbook that is coming up really in a few months. And this is an actionable reference. And Aaron is also one of the editors here. And I hope you will take this because this is also open source. And this has some of the ideas that we have discussed here. And we hope to hear from you and be a part of this global community that we're trying to build around this water diplomacy idea. And again, thank you very much. No, thank you, Shafiq, for taking time, especially so early in the morning. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Emma Hakala. She's a visiting senior fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, and she'll be in introducing and moderating our panel discussion. So thank you very much. Emma, over to you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, um, yes, nice to be here. Great to be here um, uh, moderating this uh, this panel discussion especially with such great uh, speakers. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a great pleasure to talk with such um, experts on these, these topics and to continue on these uh, similar issues and maybe build upon uh, what was just, just said during the sort of introductory presentation. Uh, so I will now uh, present our, our panel and then we'll jump right into the discussion uh, so we have three panelists. Um, all of them are have a very uh, long background on water diplomacy and, and related um, issues. So first we have Tanya Mishkova, who is the ambassador in charge of water diplomacy and circular economy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia. And uh, she has served in several uh, high positions during her diplomatic uh, career and now especially uh, focusing on, on water uh, then we have Dr. Alexandros Makarigakis, who is uh, director and representative of AI of uh, UNESCO's multi-sectoral regional office for Eastern Africa in Nairobi. And he has worked on uh, natural resources management and specialized on water and environment issues. Uh, and then finally, we have Dr. Maria Gwyn, uh, who is a senior fellow at the International Law Institute. She's an international lawyer and 
an international arbitrator and among other things um, she's the international association for water law representative before UN water so great to have all of you here uh, thanks for taking part in this discussion um, and let's get started with uh, not a very small or necessarily easy question I thought that we would uh, kind of kick off by asking every one of you for your points of view about uh, whether you could describe some uh, hopefully concrete examples of situations where in your own work perhaps uh, where water diplomacy has led to better outcomes meaning that it has been somehow invaluable in realizing a process that would not otherwise have taken place or or been possible uh, maybe i'll first start with tanya please Thank you, Emma. Um, well, I would uh, name an example, uh, a recent example. I was part of the broader effort uh, that succeeded on, in putting transboundary water cooperation on the, on the agenda of the UN 2023 Water Conference. Uh, it was an uphill battle, uh, but persistent effort by a group of countries and organizations uh, such as you know, Slovenia, Senegal, um, the World Bank, many, many others. Uh, some of them also joined forces uh, in the Transboundary Water Cooperation uh, Coalition, uh, we then succeeded. And not only was transboundary cooperation on the agenda uh, within the Interactive Dialogue 4, but also numerous commitments uh, were made uh, to the water action agenda. Uh, and we see more countries uh, acceding to the UN Water Convention. Um, the EU has been a strong advocate, speaking consistently with one voice uh, based on its council conclusions on water and EU external action, which were adopted during Slovenia's EU council presidency, which I also count as uh, part of Slovenia's success. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tania. Um, then perhaps Maria can be the next. Well, thank you very much. And um, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today with all of you. For me, it will be um, the special operation water windows. Here, water diplomacy was crucial to overcome challenges posed during the worst hydrological crisis in the history of South America, of the South American region. And the consequence of the drought were exasperated by the fact that Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay not only share the international river Parana, but they also use the river for very different purposes, like energy production, hydropower, navigation, and even water consumption. So when the levels of the river flow were so low that there was almost no water, the tensions among the three countries started to rise because, of course, every country wanted uh, to satisfy their, their own needs associated to that particular river. So there was a request to open the water reservoir of the most important dam in that river. And of course, from a technical point of view, this was also very difficult because there was very little water available. And it was thought that opening the reservoir could compromise the energy production. And I was one of the members of the governing council of that dam at the time. And the decision to whether to open the reservoir came to us. And having heard the technical considerations, uh, for me, it was important to draw on international law and in particular on the main principles of international water law that govern the utilization of international rivers. That is the principles of equitable and reasonable use and that of no, no harm. So putting these at the center of the discussion meant that we had to consider the interests of all parties and try to accommodate them. So we decided to form an ad hoc intergovernmental committee in which every party was to say precisely how much water they needed, respectively, to satisfy their own needs. And the committee the committee did not only include the three states, but also, for example, representative of the shipping industry, the Association of Ports and National Electricity Companies. The deliberations and conclusions of the committee were summarized in a report. And in the end, it was possible to open the water reservoir in such a way that as a result, the demands of every party 
could be satisfied without compromising the energy production. And this was possible because of the data collected by the committee. Um, it allowed to open the reservoir at precisely intervals uh, that were at precisely determined times that gave us the exact amount of water flow needed at those times. And this was why the operation was called Water Windows. And it was an exemplary action of corporations. All parties coordinated their efforts so that at that moment they could maximize the use of the river. The measure was repeated on other similar occasions on low river flow. And it resulted in an unparalleled success, which eased the tension uh, of all the three riparian countries with a harmonious solution. And it is therefore considered today one of the global examples of successful transboundary water cooperation. Thank you. Really interesting examples. Uh, and maybe we can still get back to to some of them in the discussion. But uh, let's th then still go to Alexandros. Thank you, thank you, Emma. Uh, uh, from my end, I will bring up two elements. One is more at a global level with the establishment of the International Shared Aquifer Resource Management Program, which was established in 2000. Uh, it was the first time that we start discussing transboundary aquifers. Uh, as we know, groundwater is invisible, so it's very difficult to discuss how we can share it. And although we have double minimum, more than double of the amount of transboundary aquifers compared to transboundary basins, we have only 1% of them being covered by agreements on how to. So starting the program in 2000, uh, it took us more than two decades, but now I think uh, it has matured the conversation, especially after the publication also of the World Water Development Report on groundwater, where people start discussing these things and establish also the, the common methodology on, on how you go about transboundary aquifers, looking, on, uh, looking at issues not only of uh, legal uh, frameworks, uh, but also institutional, and for sure, uh, coming from a scientific organization, the technical and uh, uh, the technical cooperation part, uh, the identification of the bodies, uh, a, a common understanding of the resource. So establishing a methodology where people work together, uh, establish a common scientific basis, and then they're looking at their institutional and legal frameworks to be able to improve them, and then share equitably uh, the resources was one of the great achievements, I think, that we managed to have at an international level. And then bringing that down at a, a river basin organization, especially in Africa, where we have a number of them, but where the groundwater element is missing. Although 80% of the water that is being used in Africa is groundwater, right? Uh, the main river basin organizations are looking only at the surface water. So I will give you the example of Stampriet, which is a... a, a, a a transboundary aquifer shared by South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana, where we were able to uh, set up for the first time a mechanism uh, uh, in an international river basin organization, at least in Africa, where we have multi-country cooperation, right? Uh, and which is hosted by Orasecom, which is the Orange Seku River. So now uh, the, the ways that you share the water, the ways that you protect uh, the aquifer, actually, I was recently in uh, South Africa to discuss an issue of pollution of the aquifer that would influence all countries. Um, have been, uh, we have established a mechanism and then actually we're working on real problems uh, that serves the communities on the ground, like the farmers, let's say, in Namibia that uh, really rely on that source or the communities in Botswana that they use it as potable water. So the establishment basically of the methodology and also of uh, the draft articles of the International uh, Loan Transboundary Aquifers, I believe are two of the accomplishments that we have uh, managed to bring up at a global scale and then uh, bringing them down to uh, community level also. 
Excellent. Thank you. Those are very illuminating examples. And I think they very nicely show that you actually need to have several different aspects, like you need to have the legal basis, but then you also need to have the institutions and you need to have the, the science and somehow you need to be able to bring all of these um, together. And maybe we can still uh, later on talk a little bit more about what actually success means uh, in water diplomacy. Um, but maybe at, at this moment, I would go to to some questions to, to each of you individually. Um, starting perhaps with Tanya, uh, I would like to ask uh, you how you see the role of, uh, of kind of external actors in international water diplomacy, like, for example, state actors, uh, and especially perhaps uh, what kind of a role can small states have in, in acting on the water diplomacy field? Um, yeah, there are several roles that external actors can play, uh, an observer, facilitator, mediator, arbitrator, enabler, or implementing partner. Um, some countries refuse any kind of involvement. I call them the sovereignist camp. Uh, they would at best accept a neutral observer. Um, in some basins, third party uh, involvement was uh, actually an essential component which allowed uh, for the transboundary cooperation to evolve. Um, when countries are not talking to each other or, or were recently even embroiled in an armed conflict, an outside facilitator was then able to prompt or push the parties to sit at the table and start talking using both sticks and carrots. Um, of course, in case of disputes, parties often engage a mediator or an arbitrator. Um, when we have effective um, cooperative framework, uh, it usually takes a third party involvement to push the cooperation to the next level. Uh, either by providing uh, policy advice or technical uh, expertise, support, capacity building, or finance. And also third parties are needed as implementing partners. Uh, small countries um, may actually have fewer resources um, to engage in a serious negotiation or, or mediation process, but they, I think they stand a better chance um, of being accepted as, as mediators because they are considered uh, like, I mean, they are more likely than the bigger, the bigger states to be considered neutral uh, without any hidden agenda. Um, they're considered better listeners, more open-minded uh, or less prejudiced, uh, and they're also more flexible. I think Finland is a good case in point. Thank you. That's nice to hear as a Finn. <laughs> um, okay, uh, thank you. That That's very uh, good thoughts about the role of the, the states. Um, then if we go to a kind of a similar question concerning international organizations, and this is then to Alexandros. Um, so what is the role of international organizations in water diplomacy? And um, how can they be active in sort of facilitating water diplomatic efforts, especially at the local level? I think you already mentioned kind of bringing um, bringing these uh, sort of bigger international uh, initiatives to the local level. So maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Okay, so I'm um, following up to my first intervention. Our role is multiple, right? Uh, first is the standard setting. So, as I said before about the, the draft articles on the International on Transboundary Aquifer, we have other colleagues uh, who have uh, set up uh, conventions uh, and they serve as the secretariat for this international convention. So, one of the aspects uh, that international organizations should play in water diplomacy is the standard setting. Then the second part is raising awareness. Right, And uh, the raising awareness, again, we're talking about as Aaron and Safik were talking about earlier uh, at different levels, right? Uh, different levels, different scales. So you can start uh, mainly at political, uh, international level, regional level, the national level. And then, of course, when it goes down to local levels with local governments uh, and communities, right? So raising awareness about the issues and explaining a little bit better uh, what is actually the issue. And then last but not least, of course, it's the capacity building. But because it's not only raising awareness, but also capacitating uh, the experts in some countries and providing them the tools that uh, they can use in order to be able to um, move towards more equitable and understand when they share uh, their resources. 
So this is, let's say, the, the sum. And then what we can do in uh, facilitating the diplomatic efforts at local level, uh, usually we, we do that uh, on a project basis, right? So, uh, and then the, the local level can be, again, between two countries or three countries, or could be also within a country, uh, but between different uh, local governments, right? Because let's not forget that, unfortunately, the political boundaries, even at the national scale, do not coincide with uh, what basins, what we would like to have as our, uh, yeah, uh, the way that we uh, do things. So in that instances, again, uh, you're looking, as I said before, on uh, a, a, a raising the awareness and capacity, building on, on setting things up regarding the, the legal frameworks that they have. How do they fare with international standards? Uh, how do they look uh, the harmonization basically of the different legal uh, instruments that they have? And then you're looking at the institutionalization. Uh, we don't want to create new institutions, but rather see how we can uh, help uh, empower the ones that they are and uh, capacitate them. And last, last but not least is the scientific and socioeconomic uh, part, right? Where you try to see how you can uh, help socioeconomic development through science. So at local level, then you're looking at the um, a delineation, let's say, of a transboundary aquifer or, or the understanding of the resource on how to share it, projections of climate change effects to that resource, uh, socioeconomic development, and also uh, the pressure that this will apply to the resource. Um, and while doing that uh, is not only to develop the tools, but like I said, to capacitate the countries and uh, to, to be able to do that by themselves. So... Our role is that practically, right? Uh, afterwards, in identifying issues and then trying to capacitate countries to do it themselves. Excellent. Thank you. That's, that was very also informative. Um, then finally, uh, to Maria, uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, water, international water arrangements and agreements, uh, especially again, from the point of view of water diplomacy, what is their role and, and what, what are they needed for? I think you kind of gave an, one example already, but uh, uh, yeah, please. Well, yes, um, I think that the benefits of having arrangement treaties on the utilization of international water courses or an international legal framework for them is that they give us certainty the certainty needed for different courses of action in the management of these shared resources. So when we have a, a legal framework, we can have norms, rights, obligations that are agreed upon in advance between different states. And this can perdure in time, which facilitates again, stability for the parties. The caveat is that the precise content of these agreements is also very important. We have agreements that are very old, drafted when we did not have the impacts of climate change that we have today or before we face these or that crisis that we have now been through. So, and though we can say the treaties are not statics and they evolve uh, with the current developments of international law. Today, we also need to acknowledge that when we draft agreements, we need them to be comprehensive and detailed, addressing the parties' concern, for only then they can be real tools that the parties can later use and relate to, both for their national actions and for their respective relations with other repairing states. Um, but sometimes uh, very general texts are drafted because they are very difficult to agree upon and they end up only reflecting aims but establish no concrete action plans or proper institutions. So legal agreements should also be sustainable. 
that these agreements must include an implementation arrangement, enforcement and dispute resolution mechanism, stages of monitoring and evaluation, and the possibility of future revisions. It is also important to overcome certain myths, for example, the myth that there must be tensions between upper and the downstream riparians because the downstream riparians is necessarily at the mercy of the upstream riparian. Instead, knowing the rights and obligations in the utilization of international water courses will be a huge help to bring about good international and legal arrangements providing the benefits for all the parties. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. And actually, I think we'll sort of um, go on to the next question and perhaps the, the final question from me. So I will actually say already uh, to the audience that you can uh, write questions in the chat and I will then pick up at least some of them in the, in the Q&A session. Um, so please uh, feel free. And I know that there already are some questions there. Uh, but perhaps uh, building upon what Maria was kind of talking about, I would still ask um, whether there is a, a need to somehow consider new approaches to water diplomacy, especially from two points of view, which uh, obviously one is uh, climate change, which is causing increasing pressure on water resources, but then also perhaps this um, increasing uh, geopolitical tensions and and maybe the even the breakdown of the or weakening of the multilateral system. Uh, do you think that these uh, these influences need to somehow be taken into account more in in water diplomacy? And then maybe what does the future of water diplomacy look like? Uh, no small question, but uh, maybe I'll let uh, Alexandros begin. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, definitely. I mean, um, th there's no one size fits all in this uh, in this case, right? Uh, and we have to look at different uh, ways of approaching uh, water diplomacy. Uh, at least in our own work, we have realized it uh, quickly. Uh, I mean, although we have developed, let's say, a methodology of how to go about it, right? Uh, looking at the different issues and making sure we have more of a bottom-up approach, right? Uh, having the science lead afterwards the discussions, right? So first, let's say, putting uh, experts together from the different countries who share the resource, uh, identifying, you know, what the resource is all about and what are the uses, and then moving ahead on the institutional and uh, political uh, and legal side, right? But we realize that this is not the way it works everywhere because of the perception uh, of uh, water uh, by different countries. So although our approach usually was bottom up, we realized pretty soon that sometimes it could be a top down approach where you know the awareness raising at high level is extremely important actually for everything else to trickle down and then be able to start this, the discussions. And then it's even um, what the discussion is all about, right? Uh, in order to succeed, sometimes you should get away from sharing of the resource, right? And, and have the discussion of the sharing of the benefits and actually not even looking at the sharing component, but discussing the common elements. Like uh, So looking at regional integration, let's say. In Africa, we have that. Uh, so maybe the regional integration could be the angle that you want to use. What are the, 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 the themes that governments want to look at? right, about their development, and then tackle these elements. And that's where the discussions about transboundary water will come in and will be resolved uh, because of their perception and their attitude towards sharing the, the resources. So uh, we realized pretty soon that, uh, as I said, one size doesn't fit all, that you need to bring in different approach when you're talking about um, the, the resource. And then, as you said rightfully, you have to start looking uh, on how projections now of the different uh, pressures, whether these are, you know, the global changes practically, right? Whether these are uh, climate change effects or a population growth, urbanization, uh, and pollution, and how does this now uh, affect the whole picture? So, uh, and this is something that we have to mainstream now in our work, because up to now, we're, we're discussing only about the resource as it is right now. 
Uh, and for me, uh, this needs to be the new standard where this is no longer discussed, but it's just part of the discussions as now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, then Tanya. Thank you. Um, agreeing with everything Alexandra has said, and, and I won't repeat it, um, but I need, uh, I think, a couple of things that, that I would like to stress um, even more is the, the need for more multi multidisciplinary um, approach. Um, and, you know, the, the diplomacy, water diplomacy constantly needs to bear in mind um, how your decisions um, intersect with larger social uh, political, environmental, um, and environmental factors, also geostrategic, you mentioned. Um, and, and this multidisciplinary approach must be, you know, taken throughout the process from the analytical diagnostic part uh, through the designing and implementation and monitoring. Um, and um, also, um, um, you, you mentioned Alexandra's the, the bottom up, top, top down, I think they need to meet so it's not just the, the, the matter of political will, you also need to prepare the ground uh, through a human rights-based approach and also um, you know, the, to, to uh, engage the, the, the communities in order for them to be ready to accept uh, whatever is agreed at the political level. And um, the, the more inclusive and equitable the processes are, the more sustainable they are. And in terms of geo, geostrategic um, considerations, I think technical solutions can sometimes um, you know, present uh, a game changer um, where through, you know, a certain technical um, um, uh, innovations, actually a country can reduce its dependence on, a, on an upstream country. So just, just another example. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, then finally, Maria. Yes, well, uh, regarding the approach, well, I think uh, that we need to be aware of the rich toolbox of international water law, of its principle, its substantive and procedural rules. And this toolbox is also allowing us to have a holistic approach, such as the weapon nexus. Um, when we, um, uh, for example, implement actions um, relating to the uses of the or the management of transboundary water resources, um, especially given, uh, given the rise of political tensions and climate and climate change. We have um, we have a concrete example. I spoke before of the special operation water windows, which show how the principles of international water law were put into practice and actually ease the tensions between the parties and brought about a balanced solution for all parties. And if you think about also uh, about the um, one of the recent disputes between Chile and Bolivia submitted to the ICJ for the uses of the waters of the Zilala, six years of dispute and very high cost of the, of the case for both country to end up agreeing to the court on the main principle of international water law, the principle of equitable and reasonable uses of international water courses such as the Zilala. And as the result, the court said that four of the submitted claims had no object because the parties agreed that the Zilala was an international water course. And therefore, this core principle applied. So imagine how important it is to stay to be aware of this principle. In this particular case, it could have saved uh, both states a lot of time and taxpayers money if they can, had considered them in their original uh, approach to the matter. For, so that's why for me, this is, is very important to consider um, the, the whole regime of international water law. Uh, and that holistic approach to every matter. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time, uh, unfortunately, for the Q&A, but I will pick up a few questions that, that we have here and uh, any one of you can, can answer. Uh, for example, I think this is a very good question about uh, youth movements and the role, uh, I guess, of, of youth in, in general. Uh, in these high-profile negotiations and arrangements, um, could they have maybe more, or would would, it, would there be more impact if, if the youth was more engaged? Uh, would any one of you want to tackle that? Mm. 
I could pick it up, I guess. Um, uh, f for us, uh, definitely, they, they should have a, a role. Uh, I mean, uh, Tanya was talking uh, about also the innovation element that can come in, right? So, uh, who is better placed uh, to to bring these elements in rather than the youth? Uh, unfortunately, uh, older colleagues are not up to date with the latest, let's say, system. So, uh, definitely, first of all, it's their future, right? Uh, I mean. I'm I'm talking now. I shouldn't be. You know, it, it should be someone younger than I, uh, having the floor. Um, it's their future that we're discussing. So uh, they have the higher stake in, in these discussions. Then you you hope that uh, the next generation and this current generation that we have are more emotional, intelligent than what we were. So uh, you 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 think that at least they will bring these elements of, of uh, technological innovation, emotional intelligence in the discussion. So uh, definitely, I can see a role for them to play there as uh, you know people who would be able to broker, let's say, uh, agreements and uh, understanding easier than others who have very uh, old seventies based ideas, right? Um, that's it. So yeah, I agree that, that it would have a, a, a good impact at a, at an international level, but definitely uh, at a, glo a local and grassroots space, they have a, a big role to play. Although, again, depending on where you are, let's not forget, like let's say in societies like Africa, the elders are the, more of the decision makers, right? Uh, so this would be also factored in, in their thinking. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, then another uh, question, which I would maybe venture to assign to to Maria, uh, about this um, situation where you have a developed country and a developing country uh, that have a shared watershed between them. Uh, how do we balance accountability, uh, taking into account the sort of gap of resources between the, the two two countries? Thank you for the question. Um, I think there we can use, for example, uh, the tool of the UN Global Water Convention. The, the UN Water Conventions already establish a set of parameters on how to use, for example, an international river. In this set of parameters, you have the main core principle, the equitable and reasonable utilization, but then you have the different factors that you have to take into account in how to bring about or implement this equitable and reasonable utilization. And one of these factors is, of course, it, it's listed, it, 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 it's, it's not a, a list that is non-exhaustive, but you have the geography, the social development of both countries, you have the dependencies on the particular uses of the water for one country or the other. And, and this is what you really have to consider. Of course, you consider the social uh, differences between two countries, but you also have to keep in mind that uh, it is an international river and both countries have the right to use them, uh, the water resources, in an equal uh, in an equitable and reasonable matter. So this is the the really the real challenge, but it, it can be overcome by addressing this concern. Put the concerns up front. What is it uh, that is needed, and that's how we can uh, achieve the balanced solutions. Thank you. Uh, then perhaps to Tanya, uh, there was a question about. Uh, how many countries actually have a water dip diplomat, uh, such a role, uh, and should all countries have some kind of activity on, on water diplomacy? <laughs> we are not that many. Um, I think uh, it's Finland, Slovenia, uh, the Netherlands, and, uh, and I think Switzerland used to have one. Um, I think the United States, but that, I think that's about, yeah, I used to, but that, that's about it. Uh, yeah, I think we need uh, more of us uh, because I, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, the preparatory process for the UN 2023 Water Conference and how instrumental uh, our efforts were in, in achieving uh, success on transboundary water cooperation, visibility um, and commitments. But we have another water conference coming up in 2026. And I think we need more, um, you know, um, water envoys uh, to keep um, 
raising the flag of transboundary water cooperation and other topical issues. Excellent, and I'm sure everyone, at least here, <laughs> agrees with that. Um, I'm afraid we are going to have to wrap up the discussion, even though there would be very interesting questions. Uh, maybe, hopefully, the discussion can some somehow uh, uh, continue. But thank you to all of our great panelists. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and I will not uh, wrap up the, the discussion in, in great detail, just to say that uh, I think this has been very sort of illustrating of the fact that uh, we really do need very different kinds of actors and also very different kinds of sort of uh, disciplinary views and, and also institutional arrangements in order to make water diplomacy happen. Uh, and there are definitely a lot still to do and to learn, but I think we also got some very encouraging, successful examples of, of what can be done. So maybe it's also about um, repeating some of those uh, those examples in the future. But that's all from me. I, I think I'll uh, give the floor to Sylvie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, everyone, to all of our panelists and speakers for such an informed discussion, for Emma for so skill, skillfully moderating. Um, just a reminder that the Art of Water Diplomacy series continues. Join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. to look more at the process of, of how water diplomacy is actually conducted and on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, for a behind the scenes of some case studies. Thank you, everyone, for joining.